A quick shout out before we begin today's episode to two of my top tier patrons. To my sister, the proficient poet, Ruthie Bannerman, and to my brother, the skilled storyteller, Molly. If you would like to also support the podcast, and in doing so earn yourself exclusive perks such as early access to every episode, bonus episodes, and more, then please do consider joining me on Patreon by hitting the link down below. Options start from just £2 per month. Welcome to Stories from the Hearth, the podcast for tall tales and fantastical fiction, short stories the likes of which you might once have heard a wandering bard tell to a group of villagers gathered around the fire. Each episode will feature a brand new story written and performed by me, Callum Bannerman. Historical, romantic, science fiction or fantasy, these are tales to transport you, doorways into another world. Episode 6 Tsuchigiri Death from the Shadows You stand in shadow. The moon is late to rise tonight, cloud cover thick and pregnant, through which peaks only the boldest of stars. In the east, a bulge of dull light on the horizon. Edo, a hotbed of filth you hope some day the Sumida River might just wash away. Barring the freckled sky and the peach glow of the east, there is no light to illuminate your way. All the better. You stand in shadow, a crossroad splayed in four fingers either side of you, out in front. At your side, the weight of a blade, newly forged, a katana, yet to earn its name. To your back are bushes high and singing, Jakeda, Jakeda. Test the ground beneath your feet. Four paces in every direction, it is firm. Churned mud of the roads, frosted hard and smooth, where you have chosen to wait. Your hands are steady, measured, brought to a quiet stillness by the warmth of sake. Its taste still coats your mouth, though hours have surely passed since the roadhouse. It is nutty, slightly sweet, expensive. Not the kind you usually drink, for tonight requires fortitude and strength and should be marked accordingly. Focus on the road. Close your eyes. Blindness sharpens the senses, blurs the distinction between the waking world and the world of dream, where time may pass without warranting inspection. The tonsure of your scalp smarts from earlier, when freshly it was shaved, Chonmaji style. Ignore it. The sensation is only distraction, and you have been trained to ignore distraction. Likewise, ignore the whorehouse itch in your groin. Ignore the ache in calves which have stood still like this since the sunset. Ignore the mild panic arising, which whispers to you, foretelling tonight passing without the ceremony. Ignore it. They will come. You stand in shadow. Finally, a break in the clouds, and a pallid moon spills through, falls upon the land as a drunk losing balance, falls upon the northbound road running straight and true from these crossroads to the mountains. You only sense these things, your head still bowed, waiting. But now, a bell, gentle as foxglove, as if awoken in the moonlight, and you tilt your gaze, chance a look. There, 
walking wearily south toward you, a peddler. He is too far still to distinguish any features, but he carries a cart. Two-wheeled thing, low axle, bears the weight upon his shoulders, and the weight must be great, for he is bent low to the ground. You imagine a tortoise in his place. Picture the childhood death you serve to the snapping turtles in your father's pond. Pitiful things. Bland in soup, though others would pretend them a delicacy. Briefly, a flicker of disappointment. An old man. Yet, what had you hoped for? Few travelled the crossroads alone, at night, in these lawless years. So old man it is. He draws closer. The bell on his cart is ancient, though polished and well kept, so that its sound fools the listener to thinking he hears the tinkle of silver, newly wrought. A peddler's trick, no doubt. Presumably, the goods he stocks on that cart of his are equally knavish, deceitful. No honour in such business. Your teeth grit, your jaw tightens. Hear his song. For as he comes, he sings, and the tune is ignoble and bass. Hey-ho, a sailor's life, I walk from town to town. Hey-ho, a peddler's strife, my back is weathered brown. Hey-ho, a hawker's life, must surely be a curse. My back is bent, my legs are bowed, the only thing that's worse is to meet a willing geisha girl. And find you've lost your purse. Say, hey, ho, a vendor's life, a vendor's life is me. Release the tension in your shoulders, your arms. Your movements must be swift and swooping, like the crane, not forced like the bull. Has this man no dignity? A peasant's humour, not fit even for himself, a man of merchant class. Closer now, he nears the crossroads. You must have patience. React, don't plan. He is old, but a peddler has surely survived much banditry before, else he is the luckiest sod in Nihon. He will be wary. The man is bald, but sports whiskers, further evidence of pollution, corruption of character. He wears a threadbare happy, unbelted, open to reveal a pot belly above a filthy loincloth. His feet are wrapped in waraji sandals, the same style which adorn your own feet. Don't let your disgust turn to rage, though. Quell it. Ignore it. His are caked with mud and mule shit from the road. He would do better to wear nothing. Yours, of course, are immaculate. Your steps calculated decisive and designed to maintain your honour. The merchant has no such concept of decency. At the crossroads now, you have positioned yourself between the south and east. To the west lies only the settlements of the hamlet people. No wealth there. The hawker stops. Has he seen you? He scans the dark and, though confident you are hidden in the quarter light, you take a silent step back. Fear not, for he is only resting, catching his breath. He suspects nothing. Minutes pass in which neither of you make a sound. He watches the stars, scratches his arse. You curl your lip, stroke the oiled camphor wood of your scabbard. A slight sweat develops along the lifelines of your palms. Wipe them against your kimono, quietly now. You require sure grip, and sweat signifies fear, weakness. Are you weak? Finally, the old man turns for the east and Edo. He passes within just a few feet of you. You smell his stench, strong after the heat of the day. His cart is heavily laden, no wonder it weighs him down. Spices, dried foods, haberdasheries, shoes of all kinds. Hanging on hooks from the terminus of the cart are an assortment of pots and ceramic jars. 
Wait. Be patient. Let him pass. On the road to Edo, he is whistling his tune again. Now, as his cart trundles past, you take your sheathed sword, and with it unhook one of the pots. Let it fall to the earth. In the soft mud, it makes a dull and sucking sound. Above the chiquita song and his own noise, the man hears this, stops. Perhaps he senses your presence now, for he does not immediately turn. He lowers the cart, steps out from under it. Looking back along its shadowy flanks, he sees only watery moonlight and the silhouette of something stuck in the mud. He could swear it wasn't there when he passed. There is nothing else. Sighing, the old peddler begins his hobble to the fallen object. As he grows neater, he recognises it as being of his wares, cocks his head, puzzled. Now how did you... He begins, but gets no further. For from out of the shadows, you step. The man clutches his chest, pales in the darkness. You stoop, gather his pot in your hands and lift it. It is made of copper and it catches the moonlight with a shine. The sheer brilliance of metal in the moonlight. You study this for a moment, mesmerised. Focus. You must focus. The pot is a little soiled with the mud of the road. You turn to the man. He is stunned to silence. His eyes, little pools of mist in which dance a cosmos of stars, strain to determine your features, backlit as you are. Taking the pot in one hand, you use the folds of your kimono, pristine, to wipe it clean. Calm now, engaged in the act, the foreplay of the act. You do not begrudge the ugliness of this action. Hold out the pot, now bow, a few inches, no more. The man is reanimated. He bows deeply in return, a little too deeply. He betrays his fear like a whipped dog. You are sure he thinks he has done well, thinks the deeper his bow, the more reverential. He could never understand your desire for precision, however, for finesse. You are not the shogun, not of a standing demanding such subservience. You doubt, however, that any one of his class could appreciate the minutiae of respect. He reaches out and takes the pot, fastens it with shaking hands to the side of his cart. His voice no longer bearing the confidence of his earlier song, the man thanks you, refers to you as Samma, as he should. Samurai Samma, he says. Arigato gozaimasu, Samurai Samma, he says. Tell him he is welcome. It is your duty to help. That you were fortunate to be waiting here, waiting for your master, when he should come along and his pot should drop. It is your pleasure, you say, to aid him. The man does not know how to receive these lavish affectations. He only smiles and nods. Deferential dog. Maintain your cool. The light of the moon catches the curve of iron wrapping your shoulder. The sheer and terrible brilliance of metal in the moonlight. It is not customary to wear iron on the shoulders, for it is a heavy material. Armourers usually reserve the use of iron for only those parts of the body most vulnerable. But not for you, for you take pride in your strength. You have been standing now for hours, the weight of your domaru a constant strain, a test of character. In the light reflected from your epaulets, you can see the veins in the man's temple, pulse. You ask him what keeps him on the road at such an hour. The man says the way from Matsumoto is long, with little trade lucrative enough to make resting viable. His accent is rough, but his logic sound. He says he must make Ido before he rests, for an Ido is surely great wealth. 
you tell him you agree, that where he is going there is not only wealth, but glory too. He is unsure what you mean by this, but thanks you for the blessing. What is your name? you ask him, and he is humbled by the question. He bows low again, and you think perhaps he may fall, stumble and collapse like that drunkard, the moon. He tells you his name is Terutoshi So, but that his friends call him Roba, for he is as good a mule as any, and he will eat almost anything. He says this with some degree of pride, and a humour lost on you. The peasantry are often vulgar, but this one is specially so, for he airs his inanities in your presence. Does he expect you should enjoy a joke like this? Keep your cool focus. The firefly waver of Edo on the horizon shimmers and falters. Dawn approaches. Well, you tell the man, Terutoshi So is a fine name. The name of Terutoshi So will not soon be forgotten, you say, and the old man bows again, his cheeks crimsoning. Retaining this posture, his face parallel to the mud, the old peddler asks you, An old man is weedy, sir, and still he has many miles to go. May he take his leave of you, sir? Watch his legs, how they quiver, his back, how it trembles with the strain of the bow. See how he leverages his weight with hands on thighs, the only ballast which stops him from falling. You draw out your response, leave a pause pregnant and hanging, relishing the ache you know he must be feeling. Enjoy this moment, it is yours. You may take your leave. You pronounce your command with strength and eloquence. You step toward the old man, two paces, three paces, four, your foot planted on ground you had made sure would be firm. With the momentum of your final step, you take hold of the hilt of your sword, hanging erect at your side, right hand to left hip. It makes a clean, virginal sound, as with a single motion you unsheathe it, bring the blade up in a wide elliptical arc. The strength of the swing comes from the trained flick of your wrist, the bend of your elbow, only locking at the last, at the zenith of its curve. Locking as you point your sword toward a lone star hung eternally from the firmament. Along the edge of your blade, a thick black, dripping from tip to hilt. In the moonlight, it shines. The sheer, terrible, beautiful brilliance of metal in the moonlight. At your feet falls the severed head of an old man. On his face he wears a coward's grin. You step once to the side, graceful as a crane, and into your shadow slumps the body of a peddler, now nameless. You take a rag of cloth from the peddler's cart, and with it clean your blade, untested before tonight. You are careful with your movements, you have proved to yourself the wicked bite of its edge, keen and incisive. A worthy blade, newly forged. A blade named Terutoshi So, with a kick like a mule. A fine ally. From the back of an old peddler's cart, absent of peddler, you take a swig of sake. Fiery stuff. Warrior's stuff. You gather a handful of dried edamame, for you have worked up a hunger and the salt of them sates the desire awoken by the drink. To the west and south is darkness, to the north the dim outline of mountains silhouetted by the moon. On the eastern horizon the light of the city mingles with the growing luster of morning sun. A new day, you think. And on your face, you wear a smile.
This episode of Stories from the Hearth is based on a real historical practice, that of Tsuchigiri, which is a Japanese term literally meaning crossroads killing. It was a practice when a samurai, after receiving their new katana, would test its effectiveness by attacking a human opponent, usually a defenceless passerby, and most often at night. The samurai who practiced this called themselves Tsuchigiri. During the Sengoku period of 1467 to 1600, there was such widespread lawlessness that the practice of Tsuchigiri, already barbaric, lent itself to indiscriminate murder, permitted by the unchecked power of the samurai. Even once the Sengoku period had lapsed into the much more lawful Edo period, this practice still occurred, culminating in the most horrible spree killing of 100 people, sex workers and men, in the Yoshiwara district of Tokyo in 1696. A final shout out to two more patrons of the podcasting arts, the novice narrators, my mum, Vivian, and my gran and papa, Sandy and Jane Bannerman. Thank you both. Thank you for listening to Stories from the Hearth. If you liked what you heard, please do subscribe, follow and share this podcast with friends, family and anyone you know who could use just a half hour's respite from the chaotic energies of the everyday. If you wish to support the podcast, please consider heading to my Patreon by hitting the link in the description. Similarly, you can check out the podcast's Instagram, Twitter and website via the links below. I will be releasing a new episode every three weeks, and with your help, in time I hope to upload them even more regularly. I've been Callum Bannerman, and you've been listening to Stories from the Hearth.